Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is AJ Jacobs, who, I mean, step aside Dos Akis. Uh, this guy's the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> uh, AJ, uh, he's an author, journalist, lecturer, and human guinea pig. Uh, he's written four New York Times bestsellers that combine memoir, science, humor, and a dash of self-help. Uh, among his books, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he's got the Know It All. He's got the Year of Living Living Biblically. <laughs> Can't say that. The it's Year of one. Living Biblically. That's he's it. got uh, Thanks a Thousand, uh, where he travels the globe to thank everyone who had even the slightest role in making his morning cup of coffee. Such an interesting concept. Uh, and then he's got a book coming out uh, in the next few months, depending on when you're listening to this or watching this, called um, The Puzzler. One man's quest to solve the most baffling puzzles ever from crosswords to jigsaws to the meaning of life. So uh, AJ, super excited to have you here. I'm delighted to be here, Chandler, uh, a big fan of the show. Well, thank you. Um, so, you know, today I want to talk about, guys, what you're in for a treat. We're going to kind of try to go two parts. So writing unique books um, and then what he's learned from four New York Times bestsellers. So it's kind of part marketing, part writing. Uh, but first... Why? Why did you decide uh, to write the first book? I think it was. I think it was uh, the Know It All, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, yeah, that was my first real book. Uh, and I, well, I, I find inspiration from a lot of places, but one is just my life. I'm always looking. I always try to have, uh, you know, another head on my shoulder saying, while I'm living life, would that be an interesting article or a book or a tweet or whatever? Uh, so. My father, when I was a kid, he loved to read, he loved learning, and he started to read the encyclopedia, but he didn't quite make it. He made it up to the letter B, like around Bolivia. And I thought, well, what if I tried to do that? You know, it's such a crazy, uh, it's like an intellectual Mount Everest reading this massive 44,000 page work and, uh, and then writing about what it was like. So that, uh, that one came from my real life, from my dad. And then I think, uh, you know, it seems like that's kind of sparked this whole almost unique writing process, which is going on these crazy experiences and then writing about them. So right. I've, got, I've got so many questions about this, but I mean, I guess for starters, like what, what does your writing process look like? And, and I guess maybe even backing up before that, how do you decide the topic that you're going to tackle next? Right. Well, I will say, yeah, I... I am pretty good at generating ideas. Like I, I generate a lot of ideas. 99% of them are terrible. <laughs> that's just something to keep in mind. I feel that idea generation is crucial, but it's also a num numbers game, you know? Yes. And, and, uh, and you talked to, I once did a, a whole article on creativity and trying to be maximize my creativity, but You'll talk to creativity experts will say, you know, it, it really is a numbers game. Picasso drew some, painted some terrible paintings. It's all about, you got to keep trying to see what, to see what works, see what sticks to the wall. Uh, so I, I do spend 15 minutes a day, every day uh, in the morning, just generating ideas. And uh, they could be book ideas, article ideas. They could be uh, just random stream of consciousness. Uh, and, uh, and every once in a while, there's, there, uh, there's a gem. I find if I, if I keep thinking about an idea, like two weeks later, I'm like, well, maybe there's something to that. And I also do a lot of uh, sort of um, unofficial market research where I'll tell people about the ideas. And you can tell, like, someone's eyes will light up. Like, you know, so, you know if they're friends, they might be polite. But you can tell the difference if mm. something new. So you're 15 minutes a day generating ideas. And then kind of just out in the wild, uh, just unofficially, uh, you know, kind of uh, street testing them. And then is that kind of how, based on that, do you then, that combined with, oh, I'm still thinking about this two weeks later, is that how you kind of land on, all right, this is the next yeah. big book project That's that I want to do? So is there I mean, it has to, there's a bunch of criteria it has to fulfill. So it mm. has to be something that I think the audience will get something out of. I think it has to be something that, that I hope will entertain them, but also make their lives a little bit better. Uh, it has to be something I'm passionate about because it's very hard to spend two years on something that, that you're not quite passionate about. Um, I, it has to be something that you can sort of pitch in a, in a one or two sentence uh, uh, way. Uh, and 
Uh, I'm sure there are other criteria that I'm forgetting, but yeah, it has to check a bunch of boxes before it'll commit. Got it. So it's, it's so those are the, at least the three criteria. It's going to entertain the audience while also teaching them something. It's something that you're passionate about. And then it can be summed up in a one to two sentence pitch. Right. Oh, so I do remember like one a marketable of, hook. Yeah, mar definitely a marketable hook. And, and the other thing is I, I like to take on uh, projects that I, I feel are, are big, like that they have, that the topic is big. So religion, health, uh, uh, you know, puzzles, uh, uh, gratitude, uh, and, you know, not, that's not every writer. Uh, some writers do a great job writing an entire book about, you know, a, a, a diplomatic incident. And <laughs> you know, that's fine. That's fine. But yeah. for me, writing the, the big topics I love because you can explore them in a hundred different ways. And then how do you, I guess on the flip side, how do you go into a big topic without being a broad book that doesn't sell well? Right. So it's not just like, like right. how do you both kind of encapsulate this big topic, but then also have kind of like a succinct hook that's compelling and unique? Well, I would say a couple of things. One is I think the, um, the structure for me is so crucial. Uh, like I've, I'd wanted to write a book about health for a long time, but I didn't, I couldn't figure out, like you said, how do I get into it? What's my hook? And then I started to think, well, what if I split it up by body part? So every chapter, you know, I have a, I'll have a chapter about heart health and stomach health, but, but, you know, everyone has that. What if I did a chapter about hand health? And there are all these people who are like obsessed with hand health and hand exercises and, you know, it's hilarious. So, um, so I was able to split it up into like 15 different chapters about 15 different parts of the body. I will say I'm embarrassed. I should have done, um, the final should have been the appendix, but I didn't, I didn't. Think <laughs> <it was final. laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it's all about the structure. The same with, um, yeah, the same with my first book, the encyclopedias. Uh, I, I came up with a structure of every chapter is a letter. And within that chapter, I'll take like 10 words, you know, it could be Abbott and Costello, and, and then I'll write like a mini essay about Abbott and Costello and, you know, what, uh, I forget what that one was about, but, oh, that one was actually about how Abbott, uh, it was either Abbott or Costello basically stole the job that Costello had another partner who was sick one day and Abbott came as the replacement and just stayed. So it was like, just be careful, don't you know? Only call, in sick. <laughs> Only call in sick if you really have to. But anyway, that was the structure, and that is how um, that is how I'm able to tackle the really big topics. Mm. Is only if you have a very set structure and angle. Got it. And so it sounds like the, coming up with a structure is almost the the prerequisite or the first thing that you try to do that then helps the writing process easier, make that easier, or is there or is it? are you six months, a year in, and then it's like the structure hits and then now the book writings. No, I, uh, for me, and it's not for everyone, the struct, I come up with a structure right at the start. Otherwise I'm lost. So for instance, this puzzle book, you know, it's a huge topic, but I said, I'm going to devote one chapter to every different type of puzzle there is in the world. So, you know, crosswords, Rubik's, uh, jigsaws, uh, logic, meaning of life. Uh, and then uh, I'm able to write it. Uh, and, and, there, and, and I've actually started books where I didn't have a clear sense of structure and they ended up falling apart. You know, I, I, after mm. a few months, I had a contract for a book right before this that I abandoned just because I felt the structure wasn't there. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. So you come up with the structure and then can you walk us through like, so let's use your, your upcoming book as an example, or, 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 you know, feel free to use any past books as well. But like, what does that process look like? Cause it's, it's a very much, I mean, not only are you kind of creating a genre of this, <laughs> this, you know, this memoir meets self-help meets humor meets science, like all that, but it's, it's an, ex, it's an, an experiential writing process. Right. So what does well, that process look like? Uh, well, there are a few strands. Uh, one is just taking extensive notes on everything that happens in, in my life. Um, there is the idea of I'm trying to go on a journey and take the reader along on a journey. So I always try to remember that. And it's good to be ignorant sometimes. 
and and you know and ask the dumb questions because the reader is not an expert on puzzles uh and a lot of it is also interviewing talking to interesting people and you know for every person who is featured in the book with a crazy story yeah i probably talked to four or five who were nice but they didn't have that story that the reader is going to be like oh man so uh and and talking to one person will often lead they'll say oh you got to talk to this person uh and and so I, anyway i take extensive notes and i since i already have the structure so i would you know interview the the guy who solved the biggest jigsaw puzzle in the world and i would uh have him in the jigsaw folder and then i would i also like to do experiment like first person so i join I represented the United States at the uh, International Jigsaw Puzzle Championship. So uh, so I wrote about that, you know, so I have like three or four elements to every chapter. And then the last thing I do is, is to write. Uh, so I have all of the research and then I finally get around to writing. And, and my writing process, which is not for everyone, but for me, I am a huge outliner. I love to outline uh, and I almost have like, for my outlines get increasingly uh, more filled out until it's almost like uh, the book appears, mm -hmm. uh, you know, starts with a skeleton and then you just keep adding muscles and skin and whatever until it's uh, actually a fully fleshed out uh, book. Mm. And are you, are you um, kind of, well, I guess first off, how long is that process usually of going through that experiment? And then are you writing and publishing kind of blog posts along the way? Or are you kind of holding it all for the book and then using those kind of in the lead up to the launch? Yeah, well, it's, that's a great question. I'm, it usually takes two years. Uh, and, and as for the blog posts, uh, I'm very torn. I mean, tradition, I publish traditional mainstream, you know, Random House is my own publisher. And traditionally publishers have been very wary of releasing the book because they think that it's like a, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, there's only a certain amount of attention that people will give, and that if uh, you blow it early on, then they're not going to pay attention when the book comes out. I don't know. It's a very complicated issue, and and I'm part of why I'm going to start listening more to your show is to figure it out because I I have um, tried to get out my process more to involve people. And uh, just one was actually turned out great because I have uh, the cover of my book is, uh, it, it's got a bunch of different puzzles on, on it, including a crossword puzzle. And it was, it was done by a very talented artist, but I put it up on Facebook and some of my more uh, uh, nitpicky puzzle friends were like, you know, that looks good, but the puzzle, the crossword puzzle is all wrong. You know, the numbers are wrong. There are no two letter words in the New York Times crossword puzzle. Uh, you know, this is a disaster. You're going to be, you're going to be uh, like nailed when this book comes out. So I was able to go back to the publisher and say, we got to redo it. And mm. they did. So, uh, so there are advantages to getting it out there. Early. Yeah. That's interesting. So let's, let's kind of fast forward to, uh, to the marketing and to the launch what's kind of your, your overarching philosophy for how you market books and, and what do you find usually sells the most copies? Sure. Well, first of all, I should say like early in my career, I was uh, sort of uh, allergic to marketing. I was like, I'm a writer. I don't want to do this. But uh, I had, I had a total reframe. I'm like, you know, this, this is not work. You know, it, it is part of my job. And if I'm going to do it, let me try to do it in as creative and fun way as possible. Uh, so now I actually enjoy the marketing as much, maybe more than writing the book. So uh, I, I before the show, I came up with like, you know, sort of four uh, pieces of uh, advice for what works for me. Um, one is, uh, you know, just trying to blanket the market and, and get as many mentions in as many different places as possible. Uh, and I don't have data on this, but at least for me, if I see a book mentioned in like six different places, I'm like, all right, fine, I'm gonna buy it. Uh, yeah. so, um, so 
I try to take my topic and then split it up into as many different slices as possible. So for instance, with the book, I wrote a book about following all the rules of the Bible as literally as possible from, you know, the 10 commandments to growing a huge beer. Uh, so, you know, I all, I wanted in the main, like the Time Magazine and, and uh, the New York Times, but I'm like, you know, there's hundreds of other websites and publications. So for instance, um, I pitched Glamour Magazine. I said, uh, what if I did sex advice from the Bible? Because the Bible actually has some very racy passages. The Song of Solomon, they talk about uh, the, the poet says that uh, this woman's breasts are like two fawns grazing in the meadows. And um, so I'm like, you know, uh, that was like, you know, make your compliments uh, creative. Maybe don't compliment the breasts, but uh, uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't fly anymore. But uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So and they were like, "Oh, that's a funny angle." You know, we don't have that. So I wrote a piece uh, for them about uh, uh, biblical sex advice. I wrote one about biblical music for a music magazine, uh, and, and on and on. You know, I I split it up into, and I'm doing the same thing with puzzles. You know, I I think that there's uh, you know, there are puzzles about food. There are, uh, so I'm going to try to pitch a food magazine about food related puzzles. One, try to just blanket the market by, by slicing it up. Um, I don't want to ramble on if you have questions about that or any comments yeah. or anything. Uh, well, I mean, I, I like that. And I think a, a, a practical takeaway for the audience as well, and specific to that is something we talk about all the time. And, and you, I call it author appearances. It's like, okay. how, do you, how do you, you know, whether it's a podcast interview, whether it's a speaking gig, whether it's publicity, PR, whatever, they're all, they're all really this bucket of author appearances with, with a goal to sell books or bring people into your audience. And so I think the one thing that you do so well, well, there's really two things specific to um, author appearances, publicity, whatever you want to call it, is starting with a hook and having a very clear, succinct, and provocative hook. I think it's, you've, I mean, that is almost even the starting point before you even write the book, mm, right. um, which a lot of people, that's, a, that's an afterthought or they don't even do it. And so mm. I think you do that really well, but then also the, the specificity of the hook for the kind of the target, the place that you're going, right? And so like, because a lot of people would think, oh, the, a book about the Bible, I could never go to Glamour magazine or I could never go to these pieces. But you're you're taking this core content and making it relevant to those outfits. And so I think those are two big takeaways for folks is start with a, a clear and succinct hook, but then also customize the hook to who you're reaching out to. And you'll be more likely to get a yes and create a piece of engaging content that leads to book sales. Right. There you go. Yeah. Love it. Cool. And actually, this <laughs> you're good. Oh, this next tip is actually quite related and because it is about customizing the hook uh, to and, and researching who you're going out for. So yeah. uh, I wrote a book where um, it, it was all about uh, family and, fam and family trees and how everyone on earth is related. And I, I had this, these researchers who were able to link me to pretty much anyone on earth. It was crazy. Uh, so I... Um, I said, you know, let me think about who, who would have big impact in New York Times. So I, um, I found a lifestyle reporter there and I, I sent him an email and said, I, I know this sounds weird, but we're cousins. You and I are cousins and here's how. And it was like 14 steps, we were like 14 steps removed. Uh, and, and I said, I just thought you'd be interested, you know, this, this is the point of my book. And uh, would you like to interview your cousin? And he responded and I got the article in the New York Times. Now it was a risk because I did that to other people, you know, some, you know, maybe 20% were like, you know, please never contact me again. Like <laughs> calling the security. <laughs> I don't think anyone said, but some people just didn't respond. But, yeah. uh, but a lot of people did because it was a unique way to reach out to the reporter. So whatever your book is, uh, you know, try to um, uh, try to find a unique way when you email them or, or DM them, have a unique angle 
to uh, why they should respond. That's so that's great. my uh, that's my next piece of advice. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, and uh, well, this one, yeah, I uh, so Mike Michaelwitz, who I'm a fan of, I listened to his show and uh, and I was taking notes. I was taking notes. This guy's good, uh, but uh, you know, one of the things he said is try to be different and. So I wrote a book on gratitude, where, as you mentioned, I, I went around and thanked everyone who had anything to do with uh, my morning cup of coffee. And uh, as part of the marketing, I said, uh, I put out on my newsletter and on Facebook, I said, I'm going to write a thousand thank you notes to readers of my books. You don't even need to buy my new book. I don't need the proof. I just, you know, this will just be a way to form a community and, and keep in touch with people. So I would write, uh, uh, you know, I said, fill out this form. And, and I did, I got, you know, more than a thousand people. And I spent, it actually took me like a year and a half to handwrite every single person on that list. And because I didn't, it was also not just like, you know, thanks for reading my books. I had them fill out something about them. You know, what do you like? What are your interests? Uh, you know, what do you like about anything in my books that resonated? And then I would tailor it to that person. So I could only write a couple a day. Um, and some of them were crazy. Like, you know, please draw me a picture of a dog eating a taco. I'm like, all right, you know, that's what you want. That's what I'll tell I'm not an artist. But, uh, but, but it was so lovely because I got, I got such good feedback from the people who got them. And a lot of them, would, would put them on Instagram or Twitter. So mm -hmm. it would sort of um, generate additional publicity, even though I was only sending it to one person yeah. that would get out there. Uh, and, uh, and it was just a great way to keep, I don't have the statistics on, you know, the return on investment on that, like how many actual books I sold, but I, I just have the feeling that it was, uh, well, first of all, it made me feel good and hopefully it made yeah. that feel good. But I also think that it was really, I, I still get feedback, you know, oh, this guy said uh, he loves your books and you wrote him a thank you note. Uh, so yeah, that that reminded me of Mike's bill where he, you know, you got to be different. You can't just do be different. the same, same yeah. email to everyone. That's great, and and so uh, I think I missed this. Were, are you were you saying the, was this like a a bulk order, a pre order campaign, and then people got a thank you note as a result of this? Were these random people, a list of people? Who were these people that were getting the thank you notes? They were people who had filled out a form on my website saying they wanted a, they were a fan of mine and wanted a thank you note. Originally, I was going to ask for a a receipt. I was going to yeah. uh, that was my original idea. But, um, and maybe that's a good idea. Maybe someone should do that. Uh, it made me a little, felt a little skeezy. Uh, and I was like, you know what? This whole thing is about gratitude. So I'm not gonna like try to turn it into something <laughs> transactional, <laughs> you know? So I was like, you know, let me try to take the high road here and just write yeah. anyone who, want, who who's ever read my books, whether from the library or not. Uh, so, so yeah, that was, uh, that was, uh, a memorable marketing, uh, uh, strategy. Yeah. That's awesome. What would you say, AJ, or your, what would you say the commonalities of your, your top selling books? Is there anything that you've noticed is, is like, oh, I did this thing or topically it was related to this or any commonalities that you see? Uh, yeah, there are a few, uh, like we talked about before, something that you can summarize in one or two sentences. So the, my, my best-selling book today mm -hmm. is The Year of Living Biblically, which, you know, you can, it, it, the title alone is basically the premise is right there. Uh, I lived the year by all the rules of the Bible. Um, thanks, a thousand sold pretty well. And, and that is uh, also easy to summarize. You know, I, I went around and thanked a thousand people who had anything to do with my morning cup of coffee. Um, I also, uh, I've given several TED Talks um, that I think do help uh, with sales. They, and even if they don't help with sales, actually, they help with getting uh, speaking gigs at uh, mm. corporations or colleges mm. or, yeah. or even churches and synagogues. So 
Uh, but for for a TED talk, you know, you have to you have to have a very specific angle, uh, and um, uh, and and these books lend themselves to that angle. Like as you said, it can't be just about a book about Canada. Like you know, it has to have a very marketable uh, uh, hook. So. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that uh, I think have helped. I, I mean, one thing that was that is interesting, I think, uh, 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 all of the books have been featured on TV or morning shows. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, it, it, you know, you would probably do better having a, a viral video, but uh, mm. but something yeah. visual. Uh, I I do try while I'm writing. I take a lot of footage and photographs mm. knowing that these tv shows are going to ask for b-roll uh, and uh yeah. and the bible book was particularly visual because the bible says you cannot shave your beard and i had mm. a crazy beard i looked mm. insane so uh you know that was actually very helpful the visual yeah that's cool so a couple routes i want to I ask a follow-up on the year of uh, living biblically and then i want to talk a little bit about the ted talk component that you mentioned so you mentioned i mean the year of living biblically is like kind of like one of the just punchiest clear direct hooks of a book that you've had anything else that you would attribute to kind of why that book has sold so well uh well first of all i think religious themed books i you know i i sometimes think i should have written another religious theme book because those actually mm. do sell well because uh at least uh if the uh, if the people in the communities like them like you know the pastors would recommend it to their uh parishioners or the rabbis and that is huge and i actually i i got lucky in this one because uh and it was partially planned but partially not it was that you know i i i didn't go in with uh, an axe to grind I, I i grew up in a very secular home with no religion but i i said you know, what what is the appeal of religion why would people still believe in this so i wanted to find both the good parts of religion and the problematic parts and uh, like fundamentalism show that that this really is a huge problem so i i tried to write a very balanced book and it and it turned out that way. So I would get, I got hundreds of letters from atheists saying, you know, thank you for showing us how crazy the Bible can be. And, but I would get the same or more from religious people saying, you know, thank you for showing the good side of religion and helping oh, wow. me my faith. So yeah. I got very lucky uh, in that, in that sense. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. And so you feel like by writing an objective book, it led to a better book which led to it being recommended by people who were on both sides. Yes. I mean, I wouldn't use the word objective because it's very subjective. It was all about my sure. experience, but I yeah, would say um, yeah. I tried to write a balanced book. I, I tried to be driven by curiosity uh, in all of my books uh, because, uh, which is the whole point of the puzzle book. It's all about curiosity. Uh, yeah. And I, at least for me, that has worked out. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of books that are very argumentative that do great. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, maybe I would do better if, uh, you know, you look at the bestseller list, there's a lot, you know, uh, Trump is, uh, is the devil or Trump is, uh, is God, you know, <laughs> those books, those books do sell. Uh, yeah. So I'm not saying mine is the only route, um, yeah. but, it, but this is the one that I feel most comfortable with and, and so far has worked for me. Yeah, well, and, and just in some of my research before this interview, I mean, I think that what I found interesting, and you didn't go full blown or really anywhere on the near on the spectrum of like sensationalist type books, um, to, to your point. But what I, th what, I, um, what I think is interesting is I, I think it may have, that book may be your lowest review, like lowest like Amazon um, rating of 4.4, I think was like the average. And my hunch when I was looking at it, I'm like, you know, this is, this is probably not reflective of the quality of the book. It's the classic Perry Marshall uh, concept, if you've ever heard of it, of the three-star re reviewed book that has no three-star reviews. And it's like ah, basically all five right. stars, like raving fans. I love this book. All one stars, like this guy's an idiot. I haven't read the book, but this is so dumb and, and just kind of like this. And, and so I, I don't right. think it's anywhere near on that spectrum, but I would imagine 
somewhere within the realm of that is you kind of have that it's it's a polarizing and intriguing topic. And then people are probably pleasantly, which leads to more book sales, but then people are probably pleasantly surprised with kind of the, as you said, subjective, but curiosity driven kind of right. uh, stance of the book. But you're right. Yeah, there were people who didn't even read the book who uh, who were offended <laughs> about that. Um, I mean, my favorite Amazon review is actually for my book, Thanks a Thousand, where it was a one star review because the person, I think it was a woman, was very upset that um, she, had, she had gotten it in the same box as the mustard she had ordered from <laughs> And the mustard had spilled on my book. And uh, so I was somehow, that reflects on the quality of my book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. My favorite was uh, on one of my, I think this is my first book. Uh, it had nothing to do with mustard, but uh, somebody said, you know, I regret that I bought the Kindle version so that this couldn't even be used for something worthwhile like a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh man, first book, first one star review. This is brutal. <laughs> no mustard was harmed uh, in the creation of this negative review. Um, <laughs> well, AJ, I got a couple, we're in the home stretch here. I got a couple final questions for you. Um, you, you mentioned the TED talk piece, um, how, you know, how, how do you get booked for those TED talks and from what you can tell, I mean, obviously Amazon doesn't give you great data, um, nor do publishers, but from what you can tell, do TED talks move books and any advice for people who are kind of thinking about going down that route, whether it's a TED talk, TEDx talk, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think they do. As you say, it's very hard to get data. I mean, it's certainly is huge in terms of um, visibility. And as I say, in terms of booking, if that's the route you wanna go in terms of booking other speaking gigs, like there still is something about the TED uh, badge uh, of uh, quality, seal of approval. Uh, I would say in terms of, um, of getting it, I mean, I, I, I did it, a long time ago so it was not as big then so it was easier to uh, to pitch if you didn't have connections uh, so I just like met someone at a party and told them about my books like yeah that could be a fun TED talk um, but uh, yeah as far as I can tell in terms of pitching you definitely do want I mean one is of course like if you have a friend of a friend of a friend who knows the uh, folks at TED that that helps uh, but but certainly like coming up with a very, like we said, uh, uh, a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, big idea, hook, provocative, big idea. Provocative, uh, something that can be summarized, you know, in, a, in like a Hollywood style pitch um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, perhaps counterintuitive that, that always seems to appeal to people, um, but yeah. uh uh, yeah, so trying, I would just write it up uh, as like um, a three paragraph pitch. And then just, I'm sure there's a, a, an address on the web, TED website if you don't have someone who knows someone who knows someone. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, make it. And then um, I also find, uh, you know, before I did the TED Talks, I would, I would do other smaller events just to practice and see what resonated with people because yeah. there really is no uh substitute for getting yeah. out there and, and doing it in front of an audience and seeing what works real audience feedback and i mean pretty i know your ted talks have over 10 million views at this point um so there, there's <laughs> got to be there's got to be some uh some book sales in there <laughs> <laughs> final, final couple of questions for you so I noticed, I think it's in, in most, if not all of your book titles is, is one man's quest. Mm. What, 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 what's, what was the, what is there intentionality behind that? Is that for branding? Like what's the thought behind, behind kind of, and, or either one man's quest or one man's humble quest. Right. What's the thought behind having that in the titles? Well, I, first of all, I just think the word quest is, is exciting because it sounds yeah. like you know, an adventure. And you're also an adventure with a goal. Like you have mm. a goal. Like, am oh, I going cool, yeah. 
am I going to be the smartest person in the world? So you kind of have to read to the end. I, I did not turn out to be the smartest. <laughs> Spoiler there. But uh, yeah, the, um, and I, and this is, as I say, not for everyone, everyone, I'm not saying this is the genre that everyone should write, but I do think uh, some readers find it appealing, like to be taken along on this journey. So it's, it's makes it more narrative. It's not like, you know, here are my 10 conclusions. It's like, here, here's how I started. And here's what I learned this time. Here's the, you know, the weird side street I went down uh, and discovered uh, this. So that's why I like the word quest. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, AJ, what would be kind of your parting piece of advice um, for somewhat for for the AJ of how many ever years ago, <laughs> pre book one, and all the other AJs out there who are thinking about uh, writing their first book. <laughs> well, that's very nice. I hope there's some. Uh, I I do think the the primacy of, of original ideas for me that is so key. So I I do recommend. You know, some people get their ideas in the shower or taking a walk. I, I actually find it very useful to, as we talked about, sort of make a very, an appointment, say like for these 15 minutes, I'm not gonna look at the phone. I'm not gonna, you know, uh, I'm gonna go offline and, uh, and just generate ideas uh, and don't stop until the end of the 15 minutes because sometimes the gems come right at the end. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, to me, especially starting out no one's going to come and say hey would you write about this so yeah just take a topic you know it could be whatever is in the news maybe like you know take a topic like uh i don't know you could even take infrastructure it's a, it's a very boring word but it's important and then just like spin out for 15 minutes what could you do about infrastructure what's interesting about it? what what new angle can you take on it uh so that's, I guess, my big piece of advice that has worked for me. Cool. That's awesome, AJ. And now, have you ever, this is just a random question, but have you ever heard of Mark Rober, YouTube guy? I feel I have. Tell me what he does. What, so he just creates super, but it just dawned on me as we're doing this interview. I'm like, I feel like Mark Rober is like the AJ Jacobs of YouTube. Ah, uh, he's like this guy that's very interesting, uh, like how carnival games, how do they mm -hmm. work and how do you win them? Like oh, or, I have my just crazy stuff like that. And then oh. it, it's like a 23 minute video that just, just goes into the whole thing. Uh, so it's like very much more short form content, but like tackling this interesting thing. It's the guy who you probably oh. saw. He he did the glitter bomb, uh, uh, the, 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 the mail prank. Um, people, you, know, you ever see that? I don't know if I saw that one. People were stealing uh, uh, his packages, his Amazon packages, and then he oh, does yeah, it, yeah, he turns yeah, it yeah. into a glitter bomb. Oh, no, that was good. That was good. That was good. All right. I'm going to look him up. I mean, I, I'm some, I worked a little with um, Morgan Spurlock, who did the Super Size Me, where he ate only McDonald's. Oh, so yeah. We that's good. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He's sort of uh, in the similar genre. Yeah. I'm a fan of his. Well, AJ, this has been so awesome, man. So, guys, um, AJ's upcoming book, um, it releases in April. Um, I think if I'm not, yeah, it's April. It looks like a April 26th of 2022. Um, so depending on when you're listening to this or watching this, pre-order it or just buy it <laughs> uh, if, it's already, uh, uh, if it's already out. So the book's called The Puzzler, One Man's Quest to Solve the Most Baffling Puzzles Ever from Crosswords to Jigsaws to the Meaning of Life. Uh, AJ, where can people go to, to buy your book, pre-order your book, or just check out more about what you're up to? There are the, the usual uh, places, ajjacobs.com, or I'm on AJ Jacobs at Twitter, or, uh, and I love to hear from people. So yeah, send me a note. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Chandler. That was so fun. I had a great time, and uh, I'll be listening to get other tips from other authors and uh, marketers. I appreciate that. Thank you, AJ.